So we're going to look at verses 54 of chapter 7 all the way through verse 25 of chapter 8. But I want to start by just reading verse 51 through 60 of chapter 7, kind of connecting where we were two weeks ago. This is Stephen talking, if you remember. Stephen says to the religious leaders of his day, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the laws delivered by angels and did not keep it. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold the sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So after a fruitful ministry, Stephen had a fruitful ministry of ministering to widows, doing miracles, and most importantly, preaching Jesus. After that, he's falsely accused and put on trial before the Sanhedrin. That's this group of 70 religious leaders, Jewish religious leaders. And yet Stephen would would be bold to show his accusers that they're actually the guilty ones. They accuse him of blaspheming Moses and the temple. But actually he shows them that they got Moses and the temple wrong, and it was proven because they also got Jesus wrong. But as he accuses them, they hate him for it. They absolutely hate him for it. And so what do they do? We just read, they stone him to death. They kill the evangelist Stephen, wanting to stop the message that he has. And as we'll see in this chapter, when Stephen dies, a thousand more take his place. This is the glory of God. This is the amazing thing about our God and about the gospel that he calls us to share. Guys, listen, do you realize if we are walking in God's will, we are unstoppable until God says so? That God wants to do so much more than we can ask or imagine. But in saying that, we don't want to miss the reality that Stephen did suffer greatly. And as we'll see in the context, there was a great persecution that, was, that began against the church. This was a season of great suffering. We don't want to minimize that. We don't want to romanticize that. We should never be the kind of people that romanticize suffering, whether it's persecution or suffering that just feels random or sickness or illness. No suffering should ever be romanticized or trivialized. We need to see it for what it is, suffering, pain, difficulty. But we also need to see that God uses suffering. God in his providence uses suffering to strengthen his kingdom, to build his kingdom, to expand his kingdom. So that rather than being those who are always trying to shrink back from suffering or we stop moving forward with the Lord or stop being obedient to the Lord because we're suffering, we ought to recognize, wait, we should expect. We should expect there's going to be resistance to what God wants to do and it's going to be difficult to live in a broken world. And yet God's not ever going to waste our pain. He's going to use suffering to expand his kingdom. And so what we want to do is we want to use this text. We want to look at this text and see how this, it shows how God does this. It shows how suffering leads to the expansion of God's kingdom. It shows how suffering leads to the gospel going out further. We want to see how that works. And by the grace of God, we want to be able to follow suit in the same way. And so I want to give you three main things. And the, 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 the first one and the third one is where we're going to spend the most time. The second one, uh, it, it, we're going to go a bit, the second point, we're going to go a bit quick. So if it feels like I'm rushing, it's because I want to get to the third point, which is a little bit trickier to understand. But we have to make sure it's founded on this, the first point, 
that suffering reveals the trustworthiness of Jesus. And I hope if you don't get anything else, you get this. So look at verse 54 again. It says, Now when they had heard these things, that's the religious leaders, they're enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. What had Stephen just done in chapter 7? Stephen had shown the glory of Jesus in every scripture. He had gone through all the Old Testament scriptures and shown how the scriptures all point to Jesus. And it says, but even though they're angry at him, Stephen is full of the Holy Spirit. He gazes into heaven and he sees the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. He gets a vision of the glory of God. And this is important as well. Because when it comes to the work of the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit is to glorify Jesus. We'll come back to that in a second. And then in verse 56, it's really clear. It says that, that he says out loud, behold I, behold, I see in the heavens open the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Jesus gives Stephen this vision. God gives Stephen this vision to see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And this is important. It's important because we see in the New Testament this really clear presentation that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. Why seated? Well, you can look it up later in Ephesians chapter 2. The, the, the reason it says that is, is the fact that he's seated, it's to show us that our position in Jesus is secure. The reason we have access to the Father, the reason we can pray, is because our position in Christ is secure. He is seated. He has a permanent place. He's exactly where he's meant to be. So what about him standing? Well, in the same way that his sitting shows, his sitting at the right hand of God shows our position in him is secure, also his standing at the right hand of God shows that our faith in him will be rewarded. It's as if <laughs> Jesus stands up when he sees this scene, the first martyr, the first to die for faith in him. He sees this scene, and I can just imagine Jesus going, well done, Stephen. Well done for keeping the faith. Well done for keep trusting me in a really tough situation. Great sermon, bro. <laughs> well done. He's standing to say, look, you're secure in here. Now, the, the thing that we really need to, to recognize here is that it's through suffering that Stephen experienced the glory of Jesus. How, how do, why did he get this vision? I mean, these visions don't happen all the time. Not even in the book of Acts do these visions happen all the time. So why does God give him this vision? Why? Because he's going through suffering. And this is what the Holy Spirit wants to do. The Holy Spirit wants to give us the strength that we need to endure whatever kind of suffering we're, we're enduring for the glory of Jesus Christ. That Jesus would be seen. Listen to this. This is Jesus' words about the work of the Holy Spirit in John chapter 16. Jesus said, I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away, which tells us that sometimes being a Christian is going to be so difficult, we're going to want to stop being Christians. He says, they will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you thinks he is offering service to God. Exactly what Stephen is experiencing. But in the same context, Jesus says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will, he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. He will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, Jesus says, for he'll take what is mine and declare it to you. This is what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit isn't so much about wanting to give you guys toys that you can play with. He's not so much wanting to give us gifts that make us feel like, oh, it's amazing when I can do this. Though Jesus gives some, the Spirit gives some really radical gifts. No, it's about Jesus being glorified, about us seeing him as he is, about us making him known as he is. But not just that. It's not just through suffering that Stephen experienced the glory of Jesus. Also, listen, through suffering, Stephen demonstrates the character of Jesus. Look at verse 57. It says they cried out. This is what the, the religious leaders do when he says, I see the Son of Man, which they thought was blasphemous. It says they cried out with a loud voice and they stopped their ears and they rushed together at him. I don't know if you guys have this phrase, but we used to call this bum rushing. 
don't know if you guys have that phrase here, that slang. It basically means like if you're, uh, like when you see guys that, that you want to sort of take out, you just charge them all. Like you just aggressively charge them. This is what thugs do in America. Punk thugs. They charge. That We'd call it bum rushing. Just, ah, this is what these guys are doing. This is totally a mob riot. And they're charging this guy. They're charging after Stephen. It says in verse 58 that they cast him out of the city and they stoned him as they hit him with rocks. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. We'll talk about Saul in a minute. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord, receive my spirit. And falling on his knees, he cries out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold the sin against them. Do you see what's going on here? Like Jesus, Stephen's being falsely accused. Was he actually guilty of a crime worthy of death? Absolutely not. He had not blasphemed at all. But also, like Stephen, uh, like Jesus, sorry, like Jesus, Stephen knew his death wasn't the end. When he sees the Lord, he says, Lord, receive my spirit. He didn't say, oh, not yet, Lord, not yet. I'm not married. I haven't had children. My 501k hasn't matured. He says, Lord, receive my spirit. Just like Jesus knew that death was not the end, Stephen knew death was not the end. The resurrection of Jesus guarantees our resurrection, which is why we don't be afraid of death. Listen, don't ever be condemned about feeling, fearing the process of death. I don't really look forward to the pain of cancer or a heart attack or a vicious car accident. I don't know how I'm going to go. I don't look forward to that process of death, but I'm definitely not afraid of death. I'm not afraid of death because Jesus is alive. And Stephen felt this way. He knew this to be the case. Like Jesus, Stephen knew death wasn't the end. But also, like Jesus, Stephen lovingly forgave his enemies. How sure do you have to be about the love of God to love the way God loves? That Jesus, when he was on the cross, said, Lord, forgive them, know, it, know not what they do. That's in Luke chapter 23. So through suffering, Jesus, or Stephen, sorry, demonstrates the character of Jesus, but also through suffering, the church at large gains the credibility of Jesus. Look at verse 1 of chapter 8. So we see Saul is approving of his execution. Spoiler alert, Saul is Paul. We'll learn more about him as we continue through the book of Acts. And it says, And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried uh, Stephen and made great lamentation over him. Now, I want you to understand this, okay? When it says persecution came against the church, don't imagine uh, like Paul or Saul and his homies going into a building like this and saying, who's really a Christian here? The stories that we've heard about persecution in other countries. Don't, don't, don't think that, okay? Because they didn't meet in buildings in the first century. They met in homes, okay? So when it says persecution rose against the church, don't think the institution. Don't think government sanctions against an institution. Think people. People being persecuted, okay? And what you have happening here is interesting that, that you also have these devout men. And, and I mean, the assumption maybe is that they're Christians, but these could have just been men who weren't yet Jesus followers, but knew that Stephen was a man of, of, of character and credibility. And so they were risking association with him by burying him. Or they could have been believers who were risking prison by burying him. But the point is this. The persecution happened because religious leaders felt threatened by Stephen's willingness to suffer. They thought, we've got to put an end to this, because if, if people are willing to kind of claim visions of Jesus and then die for those things, we've got to put an end to this now. Let's put these people in prison. And so it says in verse 3, but Saul was ravaging the church, entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Shows that in the early church, both men and women had the courage to be martyrs. Here's, here's the thing that we, I want you guys to recognize, okay? See, Saul, who will one day become Paul, 
was committed to the suffering of Jesus followers. He says, look, you guys want to suffer? I'm going to make you suffer so you stop following Jesus. You know what's ironic about this? (laughs) Eventually, Saul himself would suffer more than most to follow Jesus. In fact, listen to what he wrote. This is the thing I really want you to see. Paul wrote this in Colossians 1.24. He says, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. In my flesh, listen, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction. I'm going to read that again. I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. What could possibly be lacking in Christ's affliction for us? Let me make sure I'm really clear here. Paul is not saying that somehow he's partnering with Jesus to atone for our sins. His suffering does not pay for our sins. Jesus paid it all. He says on the cross, it is finished. Tetelestai, paid in full. So, so Jesus' death on the cross pays it all. What Paul's talking about here, and what we're seeing illustrated in the book of Acts, what Paul's talking about in Colossians 1, is this reality, listen, that suffering gives, our suffering gives credibility to our suffering Savior. So that God calls us as Jesus followers to arm ourselves, to have a mindset that's ready to suffer for his name. 1 Peter chapter 4, look it up. We are called to be willing. Now, we don't pursue suffering. We don't look for reasons to suffer. What we do is we are willing. Our our mindset is armed with a willingness to suffer for his name. Why? Because we want the gospel to have so much credibility. See, here's what religion says. Religion says, if you don't believe me, I'll kill you. But the gospel says, if you don't believe me, you can kill me. If that's what it takes for you to believe, you can kill me. Guys, this is the tenor of the New Testament. This is is what the New Testament testifies of. We're afraid people will laugh at us. They were willing to die to make the gospel known, to make Jesus known. I'm not saying any of this to make any of us feel guilty. Praise God, none of our lives are at threat for preaching the gospel. Praise God for that. What I'm saying to you is that suffering is meant to reveal the trustworthiness of Jesus. Now, if we're being persecuted for our faith, we think, yeah, okay, I get it then. That makes sense. But listen, read what the whole New Testament says about suffering. You read all the New Testament says about the suffering of God's people, and it says it's normal. That's also 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. It, it, says, it says suffering is, has a point. All things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purposes. That includes our suffering, Romans chapter 8. It says, listen, it says that God is with us. God cares about us in our suffering. God does not abandon us in our suffering. He cares about us. He commands us to cast all our cares upon him. That's 1 Peter chapter uh, 5. This is what the Bible says about suffering. This is what the church got. This is why we are desperate for a fresh feeling of God's Holy Spirit. We need the kind of power it takes to endure suffering the way Jesus does so that people can see and know that the gospel's true. How do you trust Jesus when after a lifelong time of parenting, your kids don't want to follow Jesus anymore? How do you trust him? How do you trust Jesus after being in a bad marriage for year after year after year? How do you trust Jesus when you see your child sick or being injured in a debilitating way? How? Only by the power of God's Holy Spirit. And it's never about trivializing those sufferings. It's about saying, God, please, by your Spirit, give us the power to endure this that people might see you. Because this is what our expectation ought to be. I want to say right now, I want to apologize to any of you who felt like if you come to Servant Church and you felt like that what we were selling you was come to Jesus and life will improve. I think there's truth to that. I can I can honestly say my life is better following Jesus than when I wasn't following Jesus. I can honestly say that. 
There's hope and there's meaning. And my suffering, which there was plenty of that before I was a Christian, and my suffering, one, isn't as much self-inflicted because God's telling me what, what I shouldn't shouldn't do. And two, listen, it always has a purpose. Always. But if you think you're going to suffer less from following Jesus, you're not paying attention to what the Scripture actually says. And if you're not yet following Jesus, if you're still kind of in undecided or still deciding not to follow Jesus is really a, a more accurate way to say that. If you're going to start following Jesus, please know it's going to be hard and it's going to hurt. But, it, but he's worth it. He's worth it. Suffering reveals the trustworthiness of Jesus. There's no other place outside the gospel where we see a God who not only promises, who promises and demonstrates that he has the power over all suffering. Jesus comes on this earth, Mark's gospel is clear, right? He has the authority over every aspect of suffering. He has the, in the gospel, we see a God who has power over suffering, listen, and a God who enters into our suffering. And then a God who suffers for us. And that God calls us to follow him even when it costs us suffering. Are you guys following me? Does that make sense? Can we be really honest? How many of us don't like that that's the case? Don't you wish it was easier? I do. Now, when you're feeling that way and you're tempted to go find a church that will tell you it's easier, please don't. Now, if you want to find a church that helps you better than us, please do. (laughs) But don't, don't, please believe the garbage that's out there that says, follow Jesus and your life will just get easier. It's just not true. And the early church knew it wasn't true. And we need to know it's not true. Suffering reveals the trustworthiness of God. And what we need to know more than anything is that Jesus is trustworthy. Amen? Now, the trustworthiness of Jesus, as we know the trustworthiness of Jesus, listen, that motivates a boldness in mission. That is, fulfilling the mission that he's given us. This is the one we'll go kind of fast through. Look at verse 4. It says, now, those who were scattered, that is, remember, they were scattered throughout all Judea and Samaria, went about preaching the word. So there's a great persecution. They got to flee from the persecution. So what do they do? We best be quiet. Let's things get really rough for us. No, they kept preaching the gospel everywhere they went. They're preaching the word, listen, and it says, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. Now, it's really important that you recognize, okay, the way that Jews, remember all the Jesus followers at this point pretty much are Jews, okay? They might be Greek-speaking Jews, Hellenistic, but they were still Jews by ethnicity and by faith before they were Jesus followers, okay? Okay? Now we're talking about Samaritans, and those Samaritans were technically half Jewish. They were, they had an ancestry they could trace back to Israel. Okay, the Jews saw them as completely non-Jewish. They were worse than Gentiles in a Jewish mindset. Samaria was a place that no one wanted to go, which is why when Jesus passes through it and then engages with a Samaritan, and no less a Samaritan, but a Samaritan woman, in John chapter four, his disciples are like, "What are you doing?" Though they didn't question him. They just felt it in their hearts. What are you doing? What is he doing? Why is he talking to a Samaritan woman? Because they were not worthy to to be considered those who could worship God. They were considered blasphemous idolaters, and no Jew would have chosen to go reach them. But Philip, and we're getting introduced to another evangelist now, Stephen's now, died and gone to heaven. He's dwelling with the Father. Now we're going to be introduced to Philip. And Philip knew the one who loved the Samaritans. Philip knew the one who loved the Samaritans. And Philip didn't preach concepts. Here's where your theology is wrong. He preached a person. Here's the Jesus you have to follow. That's not me dismissing theology. You guys know me well enough to know I love theology. But the point is, he's not saying, here's a better way to live. He's not saying, 
here's a better way to think, or here's a better way to understand. Here's saying, here's the only God worth following. His name is Jesus, and he's God's chosen king who loved us and gave himself for us. That's who you need to follow. Philip preached Jesus where others didn't want to go. But Philip didn't just preach Jesus, and this is one of the cool things we're seeing now in the book of Acts, that the working of miracles, the power demonstration of God's Holy Spirit is moving beyond just the apostles. That we've seen now Stephen empowered to do miracles, and also we're going to see Philip. Look at verse 6. In verse 6 it says, And the crowds with one accord paid attention, pay attention to the phrase, pay attention, to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed, so that there was much joy in that city. Now, now Philip is here demonstrating the power of Jesus to radically change lives. And he doesn't just kind of say, hey, here's an idea for you. He preached Jesus, and then he demonstrates the power of Jesus by the Holy Spirit to these people. Like Jesus, Peter, Peter, or, sorry, Philip preaches the gospel. He does miracles. He casts out demons. If you know what a demon is, it's a fallen angel that's rebelled against God and then now wants to work with Satan to overthrow what God wants to do. They're created beings that are no match for God, but that's what they do. And Philip, in the name of Jesus, casts out these demons. And here's the reality, guys. The very atmosphere of Samaria is changing because people's lives are changing. You say, how do you know that? Because of that phrase, that last phrase there in in, in verse 8. So there was much joy in that city. There's a difference between joy and happiness. You see, joy comes not just through a change of circumstance. That's happiness. Happiness is what comes through a change of circumstance. Nothing wrong with being happy, guys. It's good. Your team wins, be happy. You you know, you, you come home to your favorite meal, be happy. Your kid actually talks to you, be happy. Nothing wrong with happiness. But joy is something different. Not just through a change of circumstance, but through a change of perspective. As we'll see in the context, Samaria had some serious issues. There was a reason why the Jews thought those people would be messed up. They are messed up. There's a reason for that. And the reason was, listen, is that they saw how broken they were and they saw how demonically oppressed they were. But when God starts working through Philip as he preaches Jesus and demonstrates the power of Jesus, what happens? Things begin to change. In fact, the change includes, listen, the challenge, or the change includes the changing of who are the influencers in their culture. Look at verse 9. Luke tells us there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself uh, was somebody great. And they all noticed, paid attention to him. From the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. Do you see what Luke's doing here? Luke's comparing the fact that they were paying attention to Simon and now they're starting to pay attention to Philip as he preaches the gospel. There's a change of the influence. They're going from this cultic, demonic, self-exalting magic of Simon to a God-worshipping, Holy Spirit-empowered, Christ-exalting ministry of Philip. A change of influence. Now, we live in a culture that's all about influencers, especially if you're a younger person. If you're a younger person who who enjoys engaging with social media, you know what I mean by influencers. People professionally call themselves influencers. Basically, what that means is they get enough followers on social media and they get people then to pay them to promote their products because they influence the sale of their products. They're salesmen, basically. And it's interesting how they get credibility. I have a million YouTube subscribers. Wow, what do you do? I play video games. People watch me. It works somehow. I do makeup tutorials. I do a number of things. Sometimes it can be good things that they do. I'm bringing this up because we need to be careful of influencers. 
I didn't say be careful of social media. I said be careful of influence. Be careful who you're looking at in social media. And this goes for all media, social media, uh, Netflix, Prime Video, wherever you're kind of absorbing, be careful of influencers. Because there's a lot of influencers that are flat bad, even in the name of God. One of the things that's really tough, and I, 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 I'll, I'll confess, I don't know how to deal with this as a pastor. I don't know how to deal with this. But you guys all come to Servants Church, and most of you guys, I think there might be some visitors here, but most of you guys come to Servants Church, and you come to Servants Church, and you hear us try to, by the grace of God, expound the Scripture. Here's what the Scripture says. But you also hear a bunch of other people during the week. A lot of you guys will probably listen to people that I would never, ever recommend. I'm not saying you're wrong necessarily to do that. I'm saying it makes it tricky. Because I don't know the, the good stuff or the junk that you might be hearing during the week. So all I can say is please be careful. Please be discerning. Please go back to the book and see if that influencer, what the influence is saying is, measures up to who Christ is. But what's really amazing is when God begins to work, and he, 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 he's showing himself, Jesus is showing himself to be trustworthy. He motivates us to be bold in mission. And as we're bold in mission, we preach Jesus and we demonstrate Jesus and things actually change. Do you want to be an influencer? I'm, I'm seriously now. Do you want to be an influencer? Forget about just social media. Think about the people that are around you in your circle of influence potentially. Neighbors, friends, family. And think about... Do they hear Jesus from you? Do they see Jesus in you? In fact, as, as Philip is faithful, what happens? Verse 12, it says, but when they believed Philip. In other words, yeah, they, they paying attention to him. They used to pay attention to Simon, but now they're believing Philip as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. They were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip and seeing, and seeing signs of great miracles performed, he was amazed. In other words, this powerful harvest of souls is being demonstrated by a simple faith and obedient baptism that even catches the attention of Simon the musician. God's doing something radical. Why is he doing something radical? Because Philip trusted Jesus. Therefore, he was bold to go where no one else wanted to go and to do what other people didn't want to do. And God used him in radical ways. Listen to this, guys. We are in a spiritual warfare, but the good news is Jesus wins. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. You see, we don't go around preaching ourselves. We preach Jesus Christ as Lord, and we ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. Your message is not... Christianity, and it's definitely not servant's church. Your message is the servant. It's Jesus. Do you trust him? Be bold. Now, this last bit. I only got about 15 minutes to do this or less. But this is where it gets a little tricky. From verses 14 to 25, we're going to talk about boldness and mission calls for authentic transformation. And, and, I, and I hope you get that main point as we talk about this, but I want you to listen, okay? Because this last section gets tricky because people will interpret and apply this very differently depending on what they assume about the Samaritans in general and, this, and Simon the Magician specifically, as well as what they believe about the work of the Holy Spirit and about how salvation works. And, and it's important, guys, because I, I, there's not time for me to kind of map out to you the different views and say, here's why I believe this one. There's not time for us to do that. If you want to talk to me about that, I'll tell you. So I'm going to just preach from a specific view, but I want you to keep in mind this, okay? Don't miss Luke's main point, Luke the author of Acts. Don't miss his main point for writing this record, that Acts is not a pattern for the Holy Spirit's work, but the purpose of the Holy Spirit's work to continue Jesus' ministry through his people, and Jesus transforms people. Do you follow me? This is not about us trying to figure out, ooh, how does, what's the formula? 
How do we get the Holy Spirit to do, the, do now what he did then? What, how does it work? What's the formula? That is not what Acts is written for. It's to show us what his purposes are. So we can submit to those purposes and want Jesus' ministry continue through us by his power. Jesus transforms people. And starting in verse 14, that transformation requires the work of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 14. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen, that literally has come upon, any one of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of Jesus. Then they laid their hands on him and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, it's important for us to recognize, okay, that there's three main reasons why the apostles send Peter and John, two out of their 12, to Samaria to check things out. There's three reasons, okay? The first is this, to confirm the reality of salvation coming to the Samaritans. Remember, the mostly Jewish church would have thought of Samaritans like, I know Jesus went there, and, but uh, I, we saw some people make professions, but these guys, I don't know. So there's going to be suspicion of the Jews towards the Samaritans, even though Jesus says to them, wait Jerusalem till you're in due on power uh, on high to be my witnesses in, Jer- in Judea and in Samaria. They're probably still thinking, I don't know. And so they send Peter and John, not because they doubt this, but they say, listen, people are going to need evidence. They're going to need assurance from us that this is real, that God's doing this, okay? So that's one reason, to confirm the reality of salvation coming to the Samaritans. The second is this, to address the fact there's been a change of pattern in how God saves people. Because what we see here in chapter 8 is different than what we heard Peter preach in chapter 2. When Peter says to the Jews, right, on Pentecost, when they see the supernatural work of God's Spirit with all God's people praying in tongues, you remember that? And they're hearing the gospel in their own languages. They're going, whoa, how's this happening? And then Peter explains and gives them the gospel. What does Peter say? Listen, Peter says to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are afar off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Who gets the Holy Spirit? Everyone to whom our God calls to himself. So this brings up a weird thing. They've believed in Jesus. They've been baptized in the name of Jesus. But it says plainly they haven't received the Holy Spirit. Again, there's different ways to explain this. One of the the versions that I will say that I think is a good version is they were born again. They had the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. But that manifestation of the Holy Spirit dwelling in them wasn't made known until this time. This is the coming upon of the Holy Spirit. That is, I think, a good explanation. But I don't think that's why Luke's writing this account. I don't think that's the main reason why that's there. Here's what I think it is. The third reason is this, to make sure, Peter and John went there, to make sure the Samaritans had the Holy Spirit. What do I mean by that? Jesus says to Nicodemus, a man who did believe that Jesus was sent from God, a man who did believe that he must come from God because the miracles he do must be from God, a man who would then be emboldened to take Jesus off the cross and help him be buried. Nicodemus, who had some measure of faith in Jesus. Jesus says to Nicodemus, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. We often call this being born again. Paul would explain it this way. God saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration, which is a big word that means born of the Spirit, and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. See, here's the reality. I believe one of the main reasons why John and Peter go is to make sure, are these guys true conversions? Are they really born again? And this is where it gets really important for us to pay attention right now. Please, I know it's been long, listen. There is such a thing as a false conversion. Someone who professes Jesus as Lord can even be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Spirit, 
and not actually been born again. And I would be remiss if I didn't call you to examine yourself to make sure you're born again. You see, here's the reality, okay? This boldness and mission that, that Philip is experiencing, that, that, that Stephen had, and that, that now Peter and John are, are, are experiencing, this boldness is, is a call for people to be authentically transformed. And they are, they are completely convinced it has to be the Holy Spirit who brings that transformation. Folks, listen. People who aren't Christians, stop. they get off alcohol and drugs. They stop smoking. They learn to be better parents. They learn to be better spouses. They learn to hold down a job. All those things people can do just by deciding, I, I need to straighten up my life. Now, oftentimes people feel like they can't ever get through that. And I'm not condemning those people either. What I'm saying to you is just lifestyle change by itself isn't evidence of the transforming work of God's Holy Spirit. Just lifestyle change isn't evidence that you're born again. So what is? What is evidence? Well, part of it is when they come and they're prayed for, not only are they professing still that Jesus is who he said he is and that their faith is in him, but as the hands are laid on them, they're filled with the Holy Spirit. And there's evidence that there's been a change that's happened in them. Now, because of this, there are groups of churches there are certain groups uh, in the Pentecostal stream that say you have to speak in tongues or prophesy to prove that you've been born again. That is not, this is not what this is teaching. I don't believe the scripture teaches that at all. At the same time, there should be an evidence that something changed. What we should be looking for in our own lives is how do we answer the question, what do I actually want? What do I want most? Because the first thing that the Holy Spirit changes in us is our desires. That doesn't mean you don't still desire bad stuff. I've been a Christian for 37, 36 years. I still desire bad stuff. It means you desire God more than bad stuff. I want Jesus more than I want my sin. I, I, I want, that's the first part of transformation. It's a heart that says, I want Jesus more. If you don't have a heart that wants Jesus more than you want your sin, you've got to wonder if you're born again. Now, please don't misunderstand me. Please hear what I'm saying. And plus, please pay attention to the context of what we're reading here. Verse 18. It says, now when Simon, let's remember this is the guy who was practicing magic before and had a bunch of influence in Samaria. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, give me this power also so that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, your, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You neither... You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Anyone who acts like you can buy your way to experiencing God is lying to you. They should not be trusted. And if anyone, if any of you thinks, hey, I, if you are in this place, like where you're like Simon, what I really want is power, influence. I want power. Because he knew he lost it, didn't he? He knew he'd lost power. And Peter's really clear in verse 23. Simon's heart is not right with God. Listen, authentic transformation requires the actual exposing of our wretchedness. 
listen to this, Romans chapter 7. This is Paul actually talking about, speaking from the perspective of a believer who's trying to be right with God by his own works, by keeping the law. It's that part in Romans 7 where he says, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I do. In other words, my, he's experienced a heart change, but he's still struggling to walk the walk. And what does he say about himself? Oh, dysfunctional man that I am. Oh, no. Oh, oh, injured man that I am. Oh, lacking well-being man that I am. Is that what he says? He says, oh, wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Well-being is important. Everyone in this room has been sinned against, and it affects our ability to walk the walk. It's, it, it's, a, it's a hindrance. I'm not minimizing that. But what the scripture emphasizes is us recognizing our own wretchedness so that we stop trusting in ourselves. And we trust the only one, the only man who wasn't wretched, Jesus Christ. We have to see our own wretchedness. Simon didn't see it, at least it didn't seem like he, seen it, he saw it. Verse 22, Peter says, Repent therefore of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible the intent of your heart may be forgiven you for I see that you are all, that you are in the, the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And so Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord at, that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Now this is where it gets a little tricky as well. Was Simon converted and just he's blowing it? And Peter's just giving a little slap? Come on. Is Simon a, a false conversion? It, it seems to me that Peter thinks Simon is a false convert. And that he's saying to Simon, look, he's discerning. Simon, I discern your bitterness. Probably he's bitter. Simon's bitter because he's lost influence in Samaria. And he's saying, I've recognized and you're still in bondage to sin. You still serve power as your God, not Jesus as your God. And it's interesting too because Peter exhorts Simon towards this humble, prayerful repentance and Simon seems to be more concerned about the consequence than he is about being authentically changed. No, how about you pray for me so the bad stuff doesn't happen? That's what it seems like to me at least. Here's the point. Whether or not Simon was converted isn't as important as that he needed to repent he needed to actually turn back to God and realize he was worshiping something other than that. This is what we mean by transformation. This is what we mean by transformation requiring a humble, prayerful repentance. Not as a one-time gig, but over and over and over and over and over again. Why? Because our hearts love worshiping false things. And when the Spirit of God exposes that, we need to turn to God. Listen to this. Jesus talking to his disciples says this. Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Repentance, faithful, humble, turning from your sin and turning to God. God, I, want, I don't want my sin anymore. I want you more than I want my sin. So I'm going to look to you and I'm going to pursue you, God. I, I, that's wretched and it's my wretchedness. I take responsibility for that, but I don't want that. I want you, Lord. This is normal Christianity. It's normal Christianity. And it leads to great joy. So this happens, and we close in verse 25. It says, Now when they testified and spoke in the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. So we, Luke leaves us hanging about what happened to Simon. One true tradition says that Simon eventually created his own cult. It's just a true tradition. We don't know how accurate it is. But we're left this open-ended. And I think we're left this open-ended because, listen, suffering leads to authentic transformation if it leads to a, knowing how trustworthy Jesus is and knowing how trustworthy Jesus leads to us being bold about mission 
And being bold about mission means expecting God to change us. And therefore, in humble, repentant faith, we call others to be changed as well. This is normal Christianity. This is happening around the world, people, whether we see it or not. And this, listen, is what the Scripture describes. Paul would write to Timothy, his son in the faith. Listen to this. This I'm going to read several verses in a row, and then I'll pray. Paul writes to Timothy, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead. Who's the judge? Jesus is. And by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, Timothy. Be ready in season and out of, Timothy, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching, for the time is coming when men will not endure sound teaching. But will have itching ears, having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded. Notice, endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Well, this may have special application for those of us who are in church leadership. It definitely has application for all of us who name the name of Jesus. Guys, what Jesus is calling us to is what he died to give us. He's calling us to be radically transformed enough that what overflows from a changed life is a clear gospel. Where we share Jesus and we show Jesus in such a way, people say, man, I need to know about this. It actually changes the atmosphere of the sphere of influence we have. We can't do this. It's got to be a work of God's grace by His Holy Spirit. But it's why Christ died and it's why Christ is saving us. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Do you believe God wants to do this? I, I honestly don't know what God wants to do through Servants Church. I, I honestly don't know. I, I have the sense that the best days are ahead. But I, I don't know what it's going to look like. But I'll tell you this. It, it's only going to happen through this real authentic transformation, and that's only going to happen if we trust Jesus through suffering. 